I was thinking while we were worshiping the Lord, and I, I know this may be taken wrong by some, I hope not if I articulate what I feel in my heart, but, you know, when we worship, we worship Jesus for who he is, which, of course, we ought to do. We worship Jesus for what he has done to the cross and provision he's made for us to be sons and daughters of God. But I wonder how often we worship Jesus for what he's presently doing in our lives. You see the difference? We worship him for who he is, as we should, but are we worshiping as well? Are we, are we singing and thanking him for what he's done in my heart this week? Am I worshiping him because I can say, Lord, you're so good, and wasn't that cool what you and I pulled off on Tuesday? Wasn't that cool how you ministered through me? You know, whatever it may be, there's that present sense of, Lord, I worship you for the reality of who you are in me, what you're doing in me. We are continuing our series that will clue up next week. We called it Full as we're dealing with the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life, what it really means to be sons and daughters of God and the things that ought to characterize our lives if we truly are sons and daughters. I think of John who said, Beloved, even now you are the children of God. Even now you are the sons and daughters of God. And though it does not yet appear what we will ultimately be, but we will be that when we see Jesus face to face. But because he's in you now, do you realize you're, you're not just Christian people, for what, however you, know, you may translate that. You are sons and daughters of God. That's who you really are. Ultimately, that's who he's come to make you and, and bring you back to. Our scripture this morning is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and Paul writes these words. We're familiar with it. He says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all show the Lord's glory, and we are being changed to be like him. This change in us brings ever greater glory, which comes from the Lord, who is Spirit. It's interesting that Paul mentions here that not every time the word Lord appears, is it necessarily referring to Jesus. In fact, he's saying here in this case, the Lord is the Holy Spirit. Just as you'll recall, Jesus referred to Holy Spirit as the Lord of the harvest. So the Holy Spirit has that title as well in a different context. And the reason I point that out is because a very common mistake that people make and that Christians make is referring to the Holy Spirit as it, right? Rather than a person. He is a person. And what that means is, as a person, he's not just a feeling. We feel him because we feel the presence of a person, right? Have you ever closed your eyes in your home and somebody's walking in, you sense their presence. Why? Because a person is here, a tangible person. And so you sense the presence. Well, in the same way, the Holy Spirit is a person, and as a person, I can have a relationship with Him. And it's in that relationship that I actually become more like Him. You know, one of nature's greatest miracles is the literal transformation of a caterpillar into a butterfly. Isn't it amazing how a butterfly can just so captivate us with its beauty? A, a caterpillar sometimes can kind of repulse you. It depends how you like little bugs. But you see a caterpillar, you know, it's on the ground, it's fat, it's slow. As I said in the first service, that was like me 35 pounds ago. But, uh, but it just changes into this sleek, beautiful creature that's, that's able to fly. And when you think of it, though, as miraculous as that is, when we look at a cocoon, we kind of see something on the outside, but we don't appreciate the miracle that's taking place inside. In fact, this incredible miracle of transformation from a caterpillar to a butterfly from our perspective on the outside, it seems rather boring. You know, it seems rather uneventful because we don't see what's going on on the inside. Now, this is just my twist on this, but as I was contemplating that thought in the Scriptures, what came to my mind was the incident in Mark chapter 9 where Jesus is on the top of a hill with a couple of his disciples, and the Bible says that he is transfigured before their very eyes. And that transfiguration, we've come to know it as I think really is a way that Jesus was also showing to us what we are like inside as sons and daughters of God. If the Lord could give us a glimpse of what is inside us because Jesus lives in us, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I and the Father will come and make our home in you. If we could really with our spirit eyes see 
who is in us, what our spirit looks like when we have come alive to Christ. I believe it's similar to what Jesus showed to his disciples when he was transfigured. Transfigured means to transform into something more beautiful, more elevated. And in that single moment, Jesus went from being an ordinary human being, which the prophet Isaiah foretold there was nothing about his physical appearance that would draw anybody to him. He was a pretty ordinary looking guy. In a moment, Jesus goes from that to this supernatural, extraordinary human being that uh, disciples were absolutely amazed to see. In fact, what was revealed in him, Mark says in verse 2, uh, was so brilliant that his clothes actually were changed into glistening white. And I really believe that in the same way, you and I, as people in whom God lives, we are undergoing this incredible work, this miracle of transformation on the inside. That's what the Lord works in us through our new nature. But just as we can't help but grow old physically, neither can we help but change spiritually, grow spiritually, transform spiritually, if we allow the Holy Spirit to do His work. Now the difference, of course, is that unlike the physical change that comes with aging, a change that, that robs us of our strength, it robs us of some of our attractiveness sometimes. It robs us of, of, of maybe that youthfulness. And again, I said in the first service that it came to my mind, that's probably one of the reasons why, if you can, it's really good to stick with your one partner for the rest of your life. Because as you get older, there's not a whole lot of people attracted to you. Okay, I mean, folks get older, you get blind, maybe you'll find somebody. But, uh, but the reality is, you know, you, you kind of want to stick with the person. Because the fact is, in, in a more serious sense, as you grow old together, Vanessa and I will be celebrating 35 years in September, which is, is not a long time for some of you who have been old or much older or married longer. But I can honestly say that the longer you're with that person, the less and less you notice the outside appearance. Now, we want to look good for our spouse. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's the beauty of the person that you fall in love with. It's the person that you see in their eyes. It's, it's all the history you have together, the things you've gone through, how you've gotten to know that person on the inside that just captivates you and, and just keeps you in love. And of course, you want to stay attractive as best you can, but that's not where the main attraction is. But the interesting thing is, Paul is saying in our spiritual lives, that that, that change that is taking place is not something we want to hide. You know, physically, you want to hide, you know, you got to put more paint on, whatever you need, and start wearing the spandex, I don't know what you call that stuff, you know, guys and girls. Uh, and all the, you just think of the billion dollar industry that are, we're just, we're such fools. The stuff we buy into, the money we blow, buying special food and buying gadgets and gadgets and, oh my goodness, God forgive us. But, you know, we get into all that kind of stuff because, you know, physically we want to try to hold, you know, hide our mass. But Paul is saying spiritually what has happened on inside of us is so beautiful, so transformational. It's not something you ever want to stop. It's not something you want to try to cover up because you actually makes you stronger. It makes you more attractive. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, our physical body is becoming older and weaker, but our spirit where? Inside us is actually made new every single day. I really believe if it were possible to see how the Holy Spirit is beautifying us when he's allowed to have his way, how he is elevating us on the inside I really believe by what we see, we would be just as shocked as the disciples were that day in what they saw Jesus change into. We'd be absolutely amazed by what we see God doing in us. I think C.S. Lewis really captured this, this concept when he wrote in a paper many years ago called The Weight of Glory. He said this, The dullest and most uninteresting person you may talk to may one day be a creature which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. I really believe that. He's not talking about us worshiping each other, but he's saying, you look on the outside and the average person looks very ordinary. Believers look very ordinary. You look in the mirror, you may think there's nothing special about you. But if the person didn't know any different, they didn't know it was you, and somehow, just like Jesus did on the Mount of Transfiguration, if he opened you up for people to see the radiance of who truly is inside of you, that person would probably think you're an angelic being. They'd probably be tempted to fall down and worship you. In fact, C.S. Lewis goes on to say, that of the heart, the life that is not redeemed by Christ, that is still darkness, he said you would also probably be repelled by the hideousness of the evil, the creature that you would see as well, that person who's not been saved and transformed by the power of God. But I think it's a rather interesting insight. 
That's what Paul was saying when he said, we all show the Lord's glory, and we are being changed to be what? Like him. Okay, now I want you to catch that because that's really the key of what we're sharing this morning. You're not being changed into just a nicer person. You're not being changed just into a better person. You are being changed to actually be more like him. You're changed to be who you really are when God made you as a child of God. The change in us brings ever greater glory, which comes from the Lord. Now, just like that caterpillar, the change that's taken place in us is not easy for us to see all at once. In fact, sometimes it's not until we bump up against a certain situation. That's why James says, consider it a thing of joy when trials come your way, because it's an opportunity for the Lord to kind of pull back the veil and encourage your heart to show you that you're growing. Because sometimes we wonder, like, is there really any change in my life? Am I really pleased in the Lord? But situations will arise sometimes that maybe were similar to past situations in which we acted a certain way, but this time when the same thing happens, we see like a different person emerging. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit, is showing us, look, see, you are growing. You see, you responded differently. Or maybe you stepped out in faith this time rather than cowering. You spoke up or you prayed with that person or you, you shared Christ or rather than get angry, you had patience, whatever it may be. The Lord shows us through things that come our way that there actually has been a change within us so that we're encouraged to continue to grow. But until that time, we can often be discouraged. We can be kind of apathetic because we, we don't really perceive a change. Because again, it's happened on the inside, so a long time can go by, and we wonder if we're really growing that much. We wonder if really this, this life that Jesus talked about is something that we're experiencing, and we are tempted sometimes, if we're not careful, to actually settle for a shortcut. And by a shortcut, what I mean, and we are all susceptible to this, and many of us may, this, may be at this place this morning, you may be at this place last week, but we are tempted to settle for a lifestyle rather than likeness. You see, because again, we don't always see the change that's taken place, even though the Lord says, and he says, trust me, if you're obeying me, if you're following my prompting, if you're in the word on a regular basis, there is change taking place in you. There's character being developed in you. But sometimes we don't see that, or sometimes we don't experience what it is our heart wants to experience in God, because we're, we're not aware of the process. We want it to happen right away, and we kind of give up on ourselves. And what we do, if we're not careful, is we settle for lifestyle over likeness, or what the Bible calls in second. Timothy 3, 5, a form of godliness. And so we settle for this form of godliness that, that's passable, you know, it's acceptable, but it's not true to who we really are as sons and daughters of God. It's not true to our true nature in Jesus. I think Paul was very intentional when he said, we are being changed to reflect God's glory. Please get that. He's not saying we're being conformed to a culture, even a Christian culture. We are being changed to be like Him. We are being changed for Him to be seen in us in ever-increasing measure. It's not something we settle for. It's a person we are growing in. This ever-increasing glory. What is glory? The essence of the word glory is simply weight, substance. It's a sense of being established in who you are as a son or daughter of God. It's a sense of knowing who you are, what you are about, what it means to be a child of God. That's the sense of glory. When the glory of the Lord appears, among other things, what it is, it's this sense of solidness, a sense of unmovability, that sense of being established. The Lord wants to bring that sense of authority into your life. We've shared in the past weeks with the Holy Spirit. One of his ministries is he, has, he brings that anointing. You have an anointing that remains in you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You know who you are. So when life comes your way, when the devil comes your way and tries to shake you, tries to tempt you, you know who you are. And you address him as a child of God, like Jesus in the wilderness. You don't waste a lot of time in the temptation. You say, it is written. I know who I am. The devil says, if you really are a child of God, you say, what are you talking about? You're a liar from the beginning. I am a child of God. I know who I am, and I know I don't have to talk to you. I don't want to waste my time on you. I know what I'm about. I know what the Father's called me to do today. I'm getting on with things that matter. So that sense of glory has to do with that weight, that sense of being established. Now, in the Greek language, which is the language the New Testament was written in before we translate into English, the word changed is metamorpho. You can hear our English word in that. What comes to your mind? Metamorpho? 
metamorphosis, right? Metamorphosis, a butterfly that changes. It means to change to another form. Now, this is very important. When a, bu when a butterfly emerges, it's no longer a caterpillar, is it? Now, just think about that. It's not that anymore. It has changed into a new form. It's not what it used to be. That's what metamorpho means. It means to change to another form. And the change the Holy Spirit wants to work in us, it's not a change of philosophy. It's not a change of worldview. To be a Christian, to be a Christ follower, is not about just cleaning up your act. That's not what it is. You're going to hopefully be a better person, live in a better way. But there are a lot of people who clean up their lives. But Jesus isn't in them right? So regardless of what we're saying on the outside, regardless of some of the things that we conform to on the outside, that's not what salvation is all about. That's not what being a child of God is really all about. We're being changed into another form. And for that to happen, we need to allow this life source, the Holy Spirit, who's outside of us, to actually flow into every part of our system and to bring change where change is needed, to work where work is needed. That's that metamorphosis that he wants to work in our life. Paul says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now again, this is my own interpretation. You can take it or leave it. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. What is he saying? He's saying, where the Spirit is Lord, that's where there's freedom. There's not freedom in your life or mine because we feel the Holy Spirit around us. You may even weep during worship whatever way that you emote. That doesn't mean freedom comes. How many of us understand we can be in the presence of God and we can go through the week as carnal as we were the week before? Right? We can be sincere. We can say, okay, God, I want to change this week. I'm going to whatever. And then nothing changes. Why? Because the Holy Spirit can be all around us, but He's not Lord. We're not saying yes to Him when He speaks to us. When he puts his finger on things that he wants to destroy, things that he wants to grow, we're not allowing him to be Lord. We're still holding on to our old nature, the way that we're used to doing things, or we're just justifying our sin. And God says, you're only fooling yourself. You're only fooling yourself. If you know sin is sin and you play with it, why in the world do you think you're a child of God? No, no. Children of God know the Word of God to them, obey the Word of truth, and they allow the Word to change them. They align their life with the image of God. So if there's anything you're doing, I'm doing in my life that you know Jesus wouldn't do, you can't play with that. You can justify it, but what does the Lord say? Justify it all you want. You're only fooling yourself. You think you're a Christian? I know you're not. So go ahead. Knock yourself out. But you know the truth, I know the truth. When you're interested in getting on with it, let me know and let's move forward. Until then, you know, do what you want. I'm either Lord or I'm not. You see, when the Holy Spirit is Lord, He's allowed to rule our hearts and speak into our lives. He's allowed to, to shape us by His truth, and that's where there comes freedom. Freedom is a product of transformation. Freedom is not just an exuberance of worship right? I can be in worship and I can even dance and do a jig, whatever the case may be, and I may feel kind of free for a little bit. But real, real worship is the outflow of a heart that's growing from freedom to freedom to freedom. That's where true worship is, right? What did, what did Jesus say? I think it was in John chapter 4. He said, those who would worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. If I really want to bring pleasure to the Father's heart, then what am I going to do? I'm going to come and worship Him, and anything He shows me that doesn't line up, I'm going to say, Jesus, thank you for showing me that. It's yours. Take it. Forgive me. Cleanse me. I'm not going to do that anymore. I just want it to be completely free. I want to offer up to you worship that has no fly in the ointment. It's just pure. That's what pleases your heart. The Father says, oh, that thrills me. Why? Because that's the worship that you need to worship me with. But also, I want you to be free. I love you as my child. I want you to be completely free. And I love it when my people worship me in spirit and also in truth. Not just academically, but there's change going on within their heart because they submit to the truth that I'm showing them. And of course, this transformation doesn't take place by attending church or singing songs or, or living a Christian life. It only happens as we intentionally work with the Holy Spirit as Lord in our life. As we say yes to every ear that He wants to, us to surrender to Him. You see, it's the difference between paint and stain. A Christian lifestyle is like paint. 
right? If you paint something, what happens when you knock up against it? You chip it, right? And what do you show? You show the color is only surface deep. That's all it is. And there are things the Lord will allow to bump up against us. Again, going back to James. Consider it a thing of joy when these trials bump up against you. Why? Because it's an opportunity for you either to be enlightened or encouraged. Either enlightened to show you, uh, hmm, that area that you thought you were a Christian, that's just surface. That's just veneer. Because that guy in the office that bumped up against you and irritated you, and you kind of, ah! What? What's the Lord showing you? Nah, I see. I'm not Lord there. No, there's still a whole lot of flesh. You're still kind of doing what you want to do there, right? And so the paint chips away, but the stain soaks right through so that you can keep getting bumped up against and bumped up against and bumped up against. And what do people see? Just more of Jesus, 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 Jesus. Keep digging, keep scraping, keep cutting. Push comes to shove. I still do what Jesus says to do. I still exude Jesus. That's what likeness is. That's what it really means to be sons and daughters of God. To be changed, to be like Him. It's not just being a nice person. It means that people don't only see you as a religious person, but they see what they can only describe as a different kind of being. Galatians 4. Paul said, Jesus fully visible in you. Jesus fully visible in you. Friends, we are being changed to be like Jesus. So that means as we, again, scrape against things, as things come our way, we find ourselves in a situation where here's what I want, but I know it's not what God says is right for me, then I choose, okay, I choose to not do that, or I choose to go His way. What am I doing? The likeness of Jesus is shining through me, and people actually see. And here's the key. People around me see He's not just religious. Oh, we say, oh, nobody's perfect. Oh, you know, whatever. No, it's not about me not making mistakes. We will make mistakes. We repent of those things, and we determine that we're going to grow through that. But my question is this. When people look at you and me, do they see a religious person? Or do they see somebody who just lives a different way? Or do they see a person who, when life happens to them, when things around the office happen, whatever it may be, your lifestyle, whatever, however you're living, they look at you and say, man, they're just a different kind of being. Do you see the difference? You see the difference? You see, lifestyle is one thing, but it's not being a son or daughter of God. That's not salvation. Real salvation, the Lord says, you can fool yourself all you want. Real salvation is you being transformed into my image. It's people looking at you in a culture that does its own thing and says, man, you just live a different way. And it's not just things you do or don't do, but when push comes to shove, you are altogether a different kind of being. You see what's happening? It's like this mount of transfiguration, whether we realize it or not. Friends, there's the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, who emanates from us, who exudes from us. I mean, we do some things that we just think are just ordinary, and sometimes it blows people's minds. Like, how come you're that way or not this way, whatever the case may be? Oh, I, I forgot. <laughs> yes, Jesus is in me. He kind of peeks out sometimes. You know, that's what you're seeing. But that's what the Lord wants us to experience, the joy of that. Jesus fully visible in your life, Paul says. And that happens when you give yourself over to the Holy Spirit for the full treatment. Because again, going back to lifestyle, you know what lifestyle does? Lifestyle says, okay, Lord, you can come this close, but no closer. You know, you know I'll, I'll conform this much. But you're not getting in here because, you see, if you get in here, then i got to contend with likeness. But as long as I keep you out here, then you can just kind of be a facade. You can be a veneer. But Paul says, don't fool yourself. There's no power in that. He said, you profess to be godly, but you deny the very power that could, in a sense, make you godly. You deny the very power. You see, you have a form of godliness but you deny the actual power of the person who could make you godly. Let me say that again. It's just kind of come to mind if I'm articulating this right. You have a form. What is form? Form is paint. Form is lifestyle. Form is the veneer. But because you'll only let the Lord get so close, but not inside you, you have a form of godliness. But there's a power in you. There's a person in you, if you know Jesus, and he will push out of you, and he will make you godly. He will make you a different kind of being. He will get you to step out and do things for the kingdom. 
rather than just looking a certain... Does that make sense? I just kind of, you know, are rambling as I say this. But the Lord says, that's why I've come for you. I haven't come to make you religious. I've come to live in you. I've come to, to be a fountain in you of life and joy so that you can actually see in measurable ways, man, I'm being changed. I'm, I'm not getting more and more religious. I'm, I'm getting more and more free. Life is making more and more sense. There's more and more joy and freedom, and I'm actually getting on with that for which God's made me. I'm not just conforming to this lifestyle. Now, it's not always easy, but I promise you, friends, after some 50 years of walking with the Lord, the life that is much more difficult is a life of compromise. I'm sure you've all had these seasons in your life, but friends, when we're just sitting on the fence, there's nothing more miserable than a Christian sitting on the fence. When you know the truth, and you're just messing around with sin, I, I mean, as the Scripture says, your own sin condemns you. It's, and God doesn't have to dump on you. We just know it's like, blah, like, I'm made for more than this. What am I doing? Right? That compromise is even worse. I love what C.S. Lewis says in his book, Mere Christianity, a great Christian classic. I encourage you to read it if you haven't already. But he said this, It may be hard for an egg to turn into a bird, but it would be a lot harder for it to learn to fly while still being an egg. We are like eggs at the present, and you cannot go on indefinitely being just an ordinary, decent egg. We must be hatched or go bad. Let that sink in. That's all... That's almost like scripture. Like I, I read that, man, that's insightful, right? I mean, how many of us go through life just being an ordinary, decent Christian? That's like being an ordinary, decent egg your entire life. The Lord says, I haven't made you to be an egg. You were created that way. That's how you started. You were made to fly. What does Isaiah say? Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings of eagles, right? They will run and not go weary. They will walk and not faint. They are kingdom people. There are people who understand the Lord wants us to be free. There are people who say, I'm going to stop messing around with sin because I'm not an egg. I don't know if some of you are old enough. Remember one of the Disney cartoons, I can't remember what it was. Remember that one with the chicken? It kind of it punches his arms and legs out of the shell, but it still has his shell on. And it's kind of running around bumping into stuff or whatever. I just, that's what comes to my mind when I think of this. I'm sorry it's not too profound this morning. I realize that, but I couldn't find another Greek word or whatever. But that's, that's what we can be like. And, and we can think that we're, hey, we're, but we're good, we're a decent egg. I think it's an expression, actually. He's a pretty decent egg, you know, got his head on straight. We're, we're a decent egg. We're not meant to be in an eggshell for the rest of our life. We, and we're either going to hatch or we're going to go bad. In other words, we've not been set free from our sin just to settle for a different lifestyle. We have been set free to participate and enjoy all that it means to grow into the likeness of God. What's the difference? Well, a lifestyle is static. A lifestyle doesn't change. Let's be honest, folks. When we embrace a Christian lifestyle, what happens? We get to a certain place where we kind of feel like, okay, I'm a pretty good Christian. I'm, you know, no worse than the guy beside me at church. I'm doing okay. And what happens? We never grow beyond that. We just, we get used to living a certain way. There's certain things we don't do. There's certain things we're supposed to do. We kind of do that, but we've just settled for that. That is lifestyle. But likeness is totally different. Likeness is in constant motion. Likeness has this continuous growing and becoming more like the one whose DNA is in us. That's why we've talked so much over the last couple of years, and we'll deal a bit more in the fall. But we talk about stepping out. We talk about what? We're talking about putting ourselves in place as kingdom people, whereas Paul says people see that we are just these clay jars. We're just ordinary people. But there's a presence in us that does things through us that we cannot ordinarily do. And they see that we're a different kind of being. God is at work in us and through us. And they see that God lives in us. That's, that's what likeness means. So it's not just this staid, predictable Christian lifestyle. There's actually a constant change, regeneration, growing more and more and more. And enjoying the journey of walking with Jesus through our lives. Why? Because his DNA is in us. You see, my father's name is Roy. And one of my aunts once said a few years back, she said, Paul, your father will never be dead as long as you're alive. What does she mean? When I look in the mirror, I see my father. If you were to see his picture, I just look more and more like him all the time. When I go to a restaurant and tell the waitress dumb jokes, my wife says, very funny, Roy. That's her way of saying, you're not funny. Leave the waitress alone. That's what your father does, right? 
Or, you know, as I get older and some of the aches and pains, I, I, I laugh sometimes. I get off the couch and like, oh. And my father, I can remember seeing that all the time as I was growing up. That DNA is inside of me. And the transformation the Holy Spirit wants to work in me, it doesn't just happen through religious rituals. It happens through a relationship with the one whose genes are in me. And those genes continue to grow and be reflected as I cooperate with what he's doing in me. In fact, that Greek verb metamorpho that Paul used to describe how we were being transformed to reflect God's glory, it's the exact same word he uses in Romans chapter 12 to explain how that transformation takes place. And this is what he says. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed, metamorpho, by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. Now look at that first part of the verse again. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed. We read that and automatically think, as the old translation says, don't be conformed by the standards of the world. I want to suggest to you that's not enough. Because a lot of us, we can be isolated from the world, right? But then we become insulated in the Christian culture. Do you hear me? And I believe Paul is also saying, I'll just read this again, it's a different translation. If I could translate the, change the word, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the Christian culture around you. Because we can settle for a religious Christian lifestyle. And it is just as empty, just as powerless, just as disappointing to God who says, I have come to live in you. I want to transform you from the inside out. You don't impress me with your churchianity, your Christianity. I've not come to bring you a new form of religion. I have come to live in you and to live my life through you. I've come to make you increasingly like me. You've got to get serious about who you are as sons and daughters of God. That's why as we move through the week, we understand we bring the kingdom with us. We're not just trying to be nice people. We are trying to go, Lord, today I pray, help me to find places of darkness. The scripture says that the dark places of the earth are full of cruelty, full of brokenness. I need to have my antennae up as I move through the day. Jesus, where can I penetrate the kingdom of darkness today? Where can your love flow today? Where can your power flow today? Where are our bodies that need to be healed? Where are our lives that need to be set free? Where are our bondages that need to be loosed? Lord, wherever I go, Jesus said, go and preach the kingdom. You see, that happens to people who are being changed on the inside. It doesn't happen if I only have a lifestyle on the outside. Because I can have the lifestyle on the outside and be full of junk inside. And really be no different. He says, this will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. To be perfect doesn't mean we never sin. The word perfect, in essence, means maturity. Perfection means that I'm growing. I'm growing in maturity to be more like the one who has saved me. And the will of God is not some big abstract plan for your entire life. I believe God's will, God's plan is what he reveals to me every single day, decision by decision, day by day. As I just walk with him, hear the Holy Spirit, obey him, he reveals to me what he's doing in my heart in the present and also what he's growing in me to reflect a greater maturity for even bigger things ahead. And this happens as we give ourselves to the Holy Spirit as Lord in our life because wherever the Holy Spirit is allowed to enter, what does he do? He gives expression to his life. And we enjoy the freedom of living as we should. Living as we were made to be, not just living as we please. I close with this scripture. Paul said in Galatians 5, at last we have freedom. Can you imagine Paul growing up in the law, you know, trying to serve God and trying to obey all the commandments and everything else and still just being empty on the inside? He comes into a revelation of what it means for Jesus to truly be in him, to be and set free. And he says, oh, people, at last we're free. At last. We have this thing we've been longing for that we couldn't do in ourselves, But God has done through Jesus by the Holy Spirit who lives within us. At last he has set us free. We must always cherish this truth and firmly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. You see, every time, we do what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. 
or we submit to the truth he shows us, it's no small thing. It's never without consequence. It's always another piece of what he's building in our life. It's that tangible. I promise you, my friends, in the smallest of ways, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you and you obey, an angel gets his wings. No, he doesn't. I'm just teasing. I'm just trying to wake you up, okay? But I think, you know, my imagination is kind of like you obey the Lord, you lock that in, and in the spirit realm you hear, cha-ching, cha-ching, tangible, great, got that nailed down. Let's go on next thing. Bit by bit, precept by precept. It's been said there are two kinds of people. Those who say to God, your will be done. And those to whom God says, do what you want. Have it your way. We've got to get serious about it, friends. We either say, yes, Lord. Or the Lord says, I love you, but you're only fooling yourself. Go ahead. Keep doing what you're doing. You're not fooling me. You're not fooling anybody else. People look at you. What do they see? They just see another religious person. They see a person who's trying good. They use religion as a crutch. Sometimes they get it right. Sometimes they get it wrong. But they're not seeing another kind of being. They're not seeing somebody who actually comes, pushed against, shoved, and they realize, I'm going to dig in my heels because I know who I am as a child of God. I'm going to do it God's way, and his kingdom is established in my life, and something different manifests from me that manifests from anybody else because I understand that where the Spirit is Lord, there's freedom. There's freedom. That's what I want people to see because people aren't attracted by religion. They're attracted by seeing a transfiguration before their very eyes. Man, you're not just a religious person. Like, you're a different kind of being. God said in Genesis 1.26, Let us make man someone like ourselves to be the master of all life upon the earth. And friends, Jesus came for one purpose. He came to restore his image in you. And he also came to restore your authority to rule in life. Relationship and rulership go hand in hand. And as his likeness is in you restored, so is your ability to move through this life with more purpose and more freedom. Isn't it wonderful when you actually move into a place, and it doesn't mean we don't slip back sometimes or disappoint or get discouraged, but when you actually move into a place where it's not just about me trying to be a good Christian, live a Christian life, I'm actually stepping out of that. And I'm actually seeing the person and power of God flow through my life. I'm actually seeing people touched by the love of God through me. I'm leading people to Jesus. I'm praying with people. I'm encouraging. You know, I'm, 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 I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. It's for that freedom that Christ has set you free. Don't go back into the lifestyle. There's nothing to that. No, no, the life will be seen in you when you choose likeness. Oh, nobody will, there will be no mixed message. People will know who you are. They will know who Jesus is. He says, that's why I've set you free. And that's not a burden God places on us. That's an invitation. He says, you get to get in on this. This is what it's all about, right? Beloved, even now you are the sons and daughters of God. Wow. You're not gonna, you can't imagine what's coming ahead, but even now you're going to get glimpses of that. But you have to choose likeness. You have to choose to be conformed to his image. Amen? Can we stand together? I'm going to ask the ministry team to come. And as always, if there's any need that you have this morning, we'd love to pray with you. But I want to invite you this morning. We had a couple dear people who gave their hearts to Christ this morning. It was a beautiful thing. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I think you've understood enough from what I've said. I'm not inviting you to accept a religion, even to come to this church. You're welcome to. I'm inviting you to understand that there is a relationship with God that you can have with a person who will come and cleanse you and free you and begin to bring you into everything he's made you to be through a living relationship with the living God. But I want to talk to you as well as believers this morning, friends. I want to encourage you, even if you just take 30 seconds to settle the deal with the Lord this morning, if you're watching online, take a moment and bow your heart and just say, I'm going to get serious this morning. I want to encourage you, if you allowed yourself to do this, to repent of lifestyle. That's just idolatry, a form of godliness that has no power in it. And say, Jesus, please forgive me for coasting. Please forgive me for just, you know what I'm saying? Jesus, I want you. I want a relationship with you by the Holy Spirit. 
I want to change. I want to repent. I want to be free. I want to be honest. I want to be clean. I want people to see. And when I look in the mirror, I want to see a different kind of being. I want to look in the mirror and see my father. Remember Dan Moeller said a number of years ago, I loved it, driving down the highway in the car, looking in the rearview mirror and just seeing Jesus in his eyes. He says, I see you in there. And that can sound really corny, but that just really blessed me. I thought, that's what it's about. Looking in the mirror and saying, Jesus, I see you in there. Thank you. That's why I worship you. Not just for what you've done. I worship you for what you're doing in my life today. I thank you. I come on Sunday, but I think back of these last seven days, and I think, Jesus, what you did there and what you've shown me, and oh, I just come and worship you in spirit and truth that you live within me and you're working in me. So I want to encourage you as I close in prayer. We're just going to play the song, and as we do, feel free to slip out if you need to. But if you don't know Jesus, I encourage you, come before you leave this place. Settle that in your heart and know him. And if you're a Christian, I encourage you this morning, if you're a true Christian, a son or daughter of God, say, Jesus, here's where I know I have to make it right. I don't want lifestyle anymore. I want to be like you in everything. I want to be a different kind of being. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your truth, that your truth sets us free. And I just pray for a break from the bondage of being like our culture of the world and being like church culture. We want to be like Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's the high goal that we get to enjoy. And so, Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit, be free to work in our hearts in a way that makes us into the army, the people that you've called us to be and the freedom and joy we get to experience in being that. And so, Lord, bless your people. Wherever we may be, I pray for grace to come clean. I pray for grace, O Lord. Oh, Father, just to be your children, to stop settling for so much less, to be your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.